वेलकम टू सिंपल करियर ए चैनल विच इंटेंस टू हेल्प यू गेट हायर्ड प्रोवाइड वैल्यूएबल करियर टिप्स बाय ब्रिंगिंग प्रोफेशनल्स फ्रॉम डिफरेंट इंडस्ट्रीज एंड हेल्पिंग यू इंक्रीज द अमाउंट ऑफ नॉलेज टू शेप योर करियर सो इन टुडेज वीडियो वी हैव मिस्टर थॉमस हु इज अ मेंबर ऑफ द ग्लोबल बोर्ड ऑफ आर्थर डी लिटिल ए मैनेजमेंट कंसल्टिंग कंपनी ही इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द कंप्लीट ऑपरेशन ऑफ आर्थर डी लिटिल इन द मिडल ईस्ट He is also a part-time faculty at leading colleges in India, such as I M Ahmedabad, I M Bangalore. So, in today's video, he will be providing values on leadership, key qualities which he looks when he is hiring someone, tips on how you can grow and shape your career, and the overall impact of COVID on the consulting industry. So, without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Thomas Kuruvilla. Thank you very much, Nigel. My pleasure to to participate and provide some inputs and thoughts. Yeah, hopefully it will be useful for uh, the listeners. Thank you. So, people management is a skill which everyone needs to develop, and it's not an easy task. So, considering that you are currently managing the entire operations in Middle East, what is your advice on leadership? What I may say may sound quite um, aggressive or not normal. the best way to for you to become a good leader is to first of all assume that you don't know anything right which means you will try to bring in the best people around you right so what you do is if the way i am running arthur d little for example you should look it makes my life and arthur d little very good when you try to bring the best people around you. not to try to bring people by which you can be the boss and everybody is below me and that i know best leaders are you assume that i don't know much bring in the best people suitable for running out the leader keep them around you and keep very a non hierarchical open door policy right you brought the right people you want them to to run the business you keep it very non hierarchical you guide them in taking decisions you allow them to make mistakes you have to encourage them because when you bring people and you if you are hierarchical it doesn't help because when you are hierarchical they are not entrepreneurial they can, they don't they don't take risk they don't take make mistakes then the fundamental purpose of getting good people is stupid right and this is the biggest mistake many organizations do and many consulting firms do what organ, good or i don't want to say good because it's not good in my view what organizations do is they go through a very elaborate process to bring in very very good people but then they are hierarchical they don't give them the flexibility the boss expects the junior to do what the boss boss tells him to do why did you bring in an intelligent person to start with you should have brought some stupid normal person you see what i'm trying to say right so the logic is people normally bring in good people but then you behave as if you are better than them you behave in a very hierarchical fashion if they make a mistake you blame them right that's completely contradictory right either you bring in stupid people which is cheap then at least you save financially and you take all the decisions or you bring in very good people and allow them to take decisions allow them to make mistakes support them and very importantly you have to develop them right you have to really because now you are not applying your mind you are developing people bringing good people allowing a good environment for them to work and they will give you good output and then you have to train them develop them develop the people to work together right and one final uh, in, input i have is you always have to ensure ethical behavior because this is something that uh, is quite lacking uh, unfortunately J- people are normally ethical it is the organization and the hierarchy and the boss and the setup is making them to behave unethical everybody wants to behave in, in an ethical fashion right let me give you an example that we do a lot of due diligence in consulting let us say right a, a due diligence i hope the audience understands what is a due diligence a due diligence is somebody wants to apply for a loan for 500 million dollars so they give the consultant the business plan the consultant has to validate the business plan and tell the bank okay you can give them 500 million dollars as a loan but the consulting project is given to you by the party who is trying to get the loan correct but if they don't get the loan 
they may not want to pay you your consulting fees which means that if you are not ethical you may tend to tell the bank that this business is good give them 500 million dollars of loan but if you are an ethical consultant you should not be worried about your fees that is it's not correct you have evaluated the situation you tell the company that sorry i cannot give you a clean chit for you to get half a billion loan because your company is risky you i don't see how you can pay back on that you still have to pay my fees because i did a due diligence i am supposed to do a due diligence and i'm supposed to tell you whether you should get a loan or not the outcome of you getting a loan was not the determinant of my fees my fees is i do a good due diligence you see where i am coming from right similarly whenever you do an organization structuring project the client almost tells you what you want you to tell them as an organization structure he may want to put a son there is uncle there is relative there or he may want to keep a position that he is important you cannot that is not ethical consulting right but the point is if you are running a business you have to give the comfort to the people reporting to you that if you stick to ethics and even if adl loses money we make loss the clients don't come to us i am not going to blame anybody of you i am going to support you i am going to encourage you for your behavior we can lose money we can lose clients we can lose consulting fee the moment you give that comfort to the people actually people are very ethical they prefer to behave ethically right the problem is they are worried whether the boss likes it because the company lost money or the dig little are not getting consulting projects nobody comes to them for a due diligence and maybe thomas doesn't like it and then they start behaving unethically the, the assumption is they want people to make money no 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 that is wrong a good boss is in addition to whatever i said should facilitate encourage ethical behavior and you should be willing to take business losses and all of that but i can tell you one last input on this topic actually you make much better better business than by doing ethical business because in the long run people will always remember that and more people will come to you than the people that you lose because of unethical behavior so even from a pure profit value creation perspective the remaining ethical will give you more business i i have seen it very clearly in adl in the short term you may lose it but in the long term uh, they will come to you i just um i'm very passionate about this topic i do have clients who are shareholders in some companies and management in some other company management means i am an employee in that company he doesn't appoint me because he doesn't he knows that i cannot manipulate the consulting engagement i am the ceo of the company but wherever i am the shareholder he gives only me the consulting project because he knows that his management cannot manipulate me you see so where i am the owner of the company he only gives projects to arthur dealer wherever he is the management he doesn't give me the project because he knows as a ceo he cannot manipulate me but he also knows that his own ceos cannot manipulate thomas you see how it works right so at the end of it the remaining ethical is always good at the end of it you can you will be happy on your own right when you do good work ethical work and all of that and the whole environment in the office is also very good yeah so as a leader in this particular field what are your expectations from new recruits or a fresher who is just joining a consulting industry also what are the key qualities which you look for when you are hiring someone before i answer nikhil let me ask you what do you think are the good qualities of a consultant because generally people seem to know what should be a good consultant let me ask you the question back let me see whether you you answer what i think is important well two main criteria which i believe is very important is uh, one a structured approach how is your approach and your thought process to a particular problem and second would be the willingness to learn so i believe it is very important to be open minded very good i think i think that's quite uh, all the all the qualities you mentioned are very very important and i think you covered most of the aspects for a good consultant but let me give you a bit more deeper insight uh from the lot of working with lot of consultants yeah the requirement of a good consultant is contradictory let me explain to you why it is contradictory 
normally when you bring in somebody into consulting they would have been extremely successful before they came into consulting firm they would have been the school topper they would have studied in iits iims ivy league business schools they would have been very intelligent uh, good in communication skills they have all the good qualities that you just mentioned and the whole world has told them that you are the best in the world before you come into consulting indirectly it makes you believe that you are always right and you are a bit arrogant and and throughout your life you have been let us say 95% 99% of the time you have been correct amongst others because that is why you are the class topper and you're doing very well and people find it very difficult to admit to a mistake the difficulty of admitting to a mistake or a difficulty to accept that there are a lot more people around you are better than you is a very important criteria or quality but consultants lack that right i, I can give you very simple examples and i've actually tested this out right when consultants make a presentation and in the process of making a presentation let us say they identify that they found a mistake in that powerpoint slide they actually pray that the client doesn't find the mistake but can you imagine how how really bad it is you are presenting a strategy to a client the client has paid you a million or a 2 million dollars the strategy you are presenting may be worth half a billion dollars because you are going to change the whole strategy and you are happy to get away with a mistake and you don't want the client to find you find that out and that is 95% of the behavior of consultants right and that is the point i'm trying to make yeah a very good consultant uh, it is rare but we try to encourage that a lot in our third deal a very good consultant when somebody finds a mistake you have to actually feel very excited and it is very rare but the best consultant is that you are very while you you have you, you need to know that you are good because otherwise you will not have the comfort to go to somebody and make a recommendation so you need to feel confident i am not saying that you need to be less confident or anything you need to be very confident because otherwise if you are not confident about yourself you cannot stand up to a board or a ceo or a chairman of a company and tell them this is what i believe you should be doing this is my analysis these are my recommendations so you need to be self confident but at the same time you need to understand that you can make a lot of mistakes the client is very very knowledgeable about the topic you should present it in a way that you invite people to criticize you that is your that should be the way you present yourself that when somebody tells you thomas i think you made a mistake the facial expression should not be defensive the facial expression oh shit did i make a mistake oh please show me where is the mistake yeah you should be very excited about it oh i'm i'm really sorry i made a mistake right or maybe somebody tells you something very fundamental i said you should be very excited oh good i learned something new right and these are the consultants whom i have found to be the most successful consultants because they expose themselves as if i am confident but at the same time if somebody tells me that i am wrong i am very excited i am very happy to be to proven wrong i am very happy that i learn something from you and i am very very happy to correct a mistake i made than hiding a mistake and moving on you see and and even i, I can even give you examples and we screen when we even interview consultants we do have a set of questions by which i can go through the question step 1 step 2 step 3 step 4 till the person talking to me makes a mistake i do have questions like that very intelligent people i may have to ask fifth or sixth or seventh level sometimes a second third level every candidate i discuss with them till they make a mistake and the moment they make a mistake the candidate assumes that they lost the interview no the decision i take on whether to hire the consultant is the way he reacts to his mistake and 80% of them when they make a mistake they defend why they made a mistake oh i brushed up my financial skills 2 years back yesterday i was a bit uh, i stayed up late i am not fresh i am sorry they come up with all funny mistakes 
20 things, right? 80, 85 percent of them. 10 percent of them will admit that they have made a mistake, but you can feel that they prefer to have avoided that discussion. Like I, I would have been happier if Thomas did not ask me that question by which I made a mistake. But there are out of 100 candidates I interview, around 5% of them, the moment I tell them that you made a mistake, they, they forget about the fact that they're sitting in an interview. They really forget about it. And they say, oh, Thomas, I made a mistake. Can you tell me what happened? What went wrong? Oh, so you are saying that this is not the way it has to be uh, calculated. Oh, the net present value application has to be in this context. The person is very excited that he learned something in the interview. And he has, in his mind, decided I have lost the job. But he's not sad about losing the job. He's happy about learning something new. This is the candidate that has 100% got the job. The other 95 has lost the job. And let me tell you why I hire such people. Because these people, even though they are extremely intelligent and they are 95% of the time uh, correct, they like to work with a team. They like to teach people. They like to learn, right? Because that is how they are. They want to learn. So whenever they prepare something, they'll go around and ask, Thomas, do you think this is correct? Can you tell me, is there any mistake? They'll go and ask somebody sitting next to them, is this wrong? And there are some people who ask you, is this wrong? They are happy to hear that you're right because they are just boosting their ego. Some people are asking because they're, they're trying to find any mistakes, right? And these consultants by far are the best consultants, right? So the point I'm trying to make is the best consultant is all the qualities that you mentioned, but is always very keen and excited to learn something. The point you made, you made that point actually, that learn something, but he's happy that somebody is teaching him something. He gets excited about it. It's not about just learning. He feels excited. He, he feels, oh, Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you very much for teaching me something. You, you see, those are by far the best consultants. But it is very rare because everybody tells them you're too smart. You're the class topper. You're first rank holder. This, this, this. And nobody can prove you wrong. And that is that is how they are developed, right? So that's what I started this this answering this question by saying that, you know, the requirement of a good consultant is actually contradictory. You have to be very intelligent. At the same time, you should be willing to learn. And you should admit that you make a lot of mistakes, which intelligent, smart people, toppers, not easy for them to say that. It, yeah, yeah. Now, what has your biggest learnings been from COVID on a personal level and on a business level? On a personal level, uh, you suddenly realize how important is it to be in the company of good people. Because in COVID, you are supposed to start practicing uh, social distancing and then you realize that when you don't meet people for a while you realize how important was your relationship time spent with friends family members clients and all of that so the value of a relationship suddenly you start appreciating it much more and before you you had a tendency to take it for granted and covid has suddenly given you that you know guys it is what the fact that you were able to spend time meet people uh, uh, you suddenly appreciate the importance of that yeah but another counter to that is you suddenly realize that we were doing a lot of things which was unnecessary, right? For example, you don't have to go to office every day. You can work from home. Yeah, the, the, you can save the time of one hour up and down. Let us say if you're working in Bangalore or Bombay, you need not have to go to the office for every day. For example, even from a business perspective, like 30% of the visits to the hospital was not required, right? I can even go onto the business side as a part of COVID, we have done many, many projects in the last, uh, let us say, four to five months. And we have covered almost every sector, right? And what we are realizing is, you can take the example of, let us say, uh, Uber or Ola, right? They digitized before COVID, but assume, but many other sectors are digitalizing because of COVID, which is what Ola is doing. But if you look at a company like Uber, what I don't know whether people know the statistics, before Uber came in, around 40% of the taxis were moving around empty, looking for a passenger, right? But the moment you have this e-hailing, 90% of the taxis are occupied, you see? Which means you suddenly require only 30% less taxis. But that is not the saving. People actually make a mistake by assuming that when I reduce the, the, num, num, uh, the uh, empty taxis, you're reducing the number of taxis and drivers by 30%. No. 
you are reducing the requirement of roads by 30% which runs into billions of dollars right similarly hospitals 30% of the hospital visits were not required people who used to go to the hospital now are not going they could have sat at home and treated themselves and they were getting cured right right so hospital space could have been reduced or healthcare expenditure could have been reduced by 30% restaurants 30 to 40% of the people are now eating at home online ordering you could have reduced the restaurant space by 30% marking getting optimized what i'm saying is because of covid people started implementing digital way of doing things and you are suddenly realizing that you can save 30% of your infrastructure it can be road it can be restaurant it can be hospitals it can be parking space it can be anything right and that is a huge realization which people people knew it was there but covid forced them to do it and then now they're getting the benefit of it right now a path to becoming a partner is not easy i'm sure it requires a lot of dedication and hard work so what advice would you give or how can someone get on that path and work towards it there are two ways to look at it you can either argue that it is uh, very difficult or you can argue that it is very simple if you have the right perspective actually becoming a partner is actually very simple right and there is only one single philosophy you need to follow in life you have to put yourself in the shoes of your client and you should never sell a consulting project to a person that if you were in their shoes you would not have bought that consulting engagement the point i'm making is like nikhil you came to me thomas i want you to help me and i'm telling you nikhil this is my value proposition and i'm going to charge you a million dollars for that then i should quickly flip myself and put myself in nikhil shoes and say okay now i know what thomas is offering i know the price he is charging i know what thomas is offering is it the best in the world if i am nikhil would i have got this consulting engagement from thomas in the answer is no i should not sell it you see the point i'm saying right and why it is very important is because if you are very genuine to the client even if you are not intelligent it doesn't matter why because you will bring in good people see the point is if you are genuine to the client you want the client to get the best outcome which means you don't have to be good you just you are genuine you will bring the right people from arthur d letter if you don't have the right people in arthur d little you will bring in external best people into the into the engagement and if the client can see through that you are really genuine to the client it is very very easy to sell consulting but people don't do this 90% of the people don't do it they put themselves in their own shoes and they try to sell consulting engagements which i don't think they would have purchased it if they were on the other side i will tell you one quick input which i realized uh, i was so excited to realize this my best clients are the clients whom i have recommended to go to my competitor i repeat in if people who have been in consulting for a very long time you know that your success rate is maybe one out of 3 or 4 right you put in 3 to 4 or 5 proposals and then you win one because that's that is the competition in consulting you have 10 12 firms and four to five of them will be around the ballpark capabilities of yours it may change the four to five out of the 10 to 12 will keep changing it's not the same set of four to five right and like everybody else your chance is let us say one in three to four but let me tell you i have if a client comes to you and you say oh my friend arthur dilit is not the best firm to do this for this one i think this is you should go to bain or you should go to mckinsey for this because i think mckinsey is good in this topic or this particular topic kpmg is better for this right imagine you nobody does that but if you apply the logic that i mentioned and you genuinely believe that i should not be doing this project mckinsey or bain or kpmg or another firm is suitable you tell the client that don't work with me you go and work with this firm okay the second time when the client comes to me and if i tell him that i am capable of doing it what do you think is my success rate i will 100% get the second project 
my success rate has become one out of two instead of one out of four to five. And I did not manipulate the client. I was really genuine to the client. But imagine I go, I, the client gives me the project because you know the same person yesterday told me, don't give the project to me, give it to his competitor. He said that to me. Today he's telling me that I will do the project for you. He will 100% give me the project. You, you see where I'm coming from. So it, if you apply this logic of being very, very genuine to the client, and you really try to give the best to the client, not what you have in ADL. You should look at what is available in the world, not available within Arthur D. Little. The client is, you are charging them highest amount, right? Strategy consulting is never cheap. So it is, it's a premium product. So when you are selling a premium product, the client deserves the best in the world, not the best in Arthur D. Little or not the best in BCG not the best in KPMG. They deserve the best in the world because they are willing to pay the highest amount. So you have an obligation to bring in the best in the world. You tell them that you are not the best or you tell them, I will facilitate along with our team to bring in the best. And if you do this, you will have a lot of clients. You will be successful and you will be easily uh, become a partner. Again, there are some general uh, uh, qualities that is expected from a partner. So I just covered one item about being genuine towards the client, right? You, you, it is also an expectation that you need to be very good in a particular topic, intellectual capital, right? Because partners are not just selling and delivering projects. You need to be good in a topic. That's an expectation. And you also, that's the second criteria for a good partner. The third criteria is you should be developing the organization, right? You should, it's not only developing the client and developing some, some intellectual um, ideas. You should also develop the organization. And the fourth item, which I think is extremely important, is you should be able to develop your team, right? So anybody who works with you, uh, every time they interact with you or work with you, they feel that they should have learned something and they have developed something, right? This is also very, very important. So to, to, to become a good partner, it is very simple if you apply all of this, right? You're very genuine to the client. You give the best to the client. You will make money for sure. You will not lose out of it. By just doing this, you will make more money, right? And you have to be genuine to, to develop some intellectual capital capabilities. You should develop the organization and you should very, very importantly develop the people who are working with you. And if, if you, this simple four criteria is met, um, you, you are, I think you will be one of the best partners in a consulting firm.